Once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to the World Over Live. Shock waves from the terror attacks in Paris continue to be felt around the world. In Jerusalem this week, Israel held an emotional funeral Tuesday for four Jews killed in the kosher market attack, with thousands turning out to mourn the victims. These attacks of terror have shaken not only the Jewish community in France, but Jews around the world and non-Jews as well. My next guest is the Nation of Israel's representative here in the U.S., and before that he served as a senior advisor to Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu in Israel. He's here to talk about the Paris attacks, the global war on terror, and the current state of relations between the U.S. and Israel. Please welcome Israel's ambassador to the United States, Ron Dermer, thank you for being here. Raymond, good Pleasure to be to with you. Pleasure to have you on the program. I want to start with the reaction in Israel to these attacks. In 2012, there was a similar uh, terrible attack in Toulouse, France. That's right. Um, this is no doubt similarly shocking. Yeah, there have been a number of attacks uh, against French Jews over the last few years. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's something that unfortunately a lot of people have gotten used to. What you have seen in recent years is you've had an immigration of Jews from France to Israel. Two years ago, the largest group, 1,900 uh, French Jews moved to Israel. The year after that, 3,500 moved to Israel. Last year, 7,000 French Jews, and we're expecting over 10,000 this year. Now, the French Jewish community is about 600,000 people, so it's over 1% of the population in 2014 of the Jewish population in France moved to Israel. That would be the equivalent of about 60,000 American Jews. So it's a lot of people. They're very concerned about the future of the Jewish community in France. And obviously, anytime you have an attack on Jews for being Jews, any in the world, anywhere in the world, it affects Jews everywhere. Uh, when Benjamin Netanyahu was in France, he said, uh, any Jew who wants to come to Israel will be welcomed with open arms. Now, some have said, some of his critics, that this will undermine the influence and the history of Jews in France, will it? Uh, no, I don't think so. It's important to understand the purpose of the Jewish state, first and foremost, is to be a refuge for the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. Jews everywhere around the world should know that they will always have a home in the state of Israel. And that's what the prime minister was projecting. Obviously, Jews should feel safe wherever they are, whether it's the United States or France or anywhere else. And Israel does everything it can to also help those governments protect the Jewish communities there. But one of the principles of the state of Israel is that we should be a home for Jews everywhere. You know, when Israel was established in 1948, about 5 percent of the world's Jews lived in Israel. Today, Israel has the largest Jewish community in the world with well over 40 percent of the world's Jews living there. And I expect that we're going to see many Jews French Jews move to Israel in the years ahead. I want to play this. This is Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. I will read the translation uh, in reaction to these terrible attacks in France. He said, if we ignore the true root of the problem, if we ignore the fact that extremist Islamic terrorism seeks to exterminate Western civilization as a whole, including the Jewish people, if we ignore this, what we are now seeing in Paris will be only the beginning. Are you concerned? Is the Netanyahu administration, if you will, concerned that the world is in a bit of a fog and not willing to see this for what it is, this Islamic terror that the world is facing? It's beginning to open their eyes. The world is beginning to open its eyes. It's taken a long time. Mm -hmm. They have to understand that the danger is militant Islam. It's not militants mm -hmm. and it's not Islam. It's the marriage. It's militant Islam. That's the problem. And whether these are the group like Boko Haram in Nigeria, yeah. or whether it's uh, ISIS in Iraq and Syria, or whether it's uh, Hamas uh, in Gaza, or whether it's uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon, whether it's Shia or Sunni, these are all terror organizations that are rooted in the same poisonous soil. And it's a global threat and a global challenge. And the first way to deal with an enemy like this is to identify it. You mm -hmm. have to understand that it's radical Islam, and it has to be confronted as one threat. Maybe in different theaters, but is one threat that all of the civilized world has to stand together to confront. There was some controversy. Uh, the French president Hollande didn't want Benjamin Netanyahu to come to this march. Uh, he eventually came, feeling he had to be there uh, as a, as part of this stand against terrorism. The Turkish president, in the wake of it, said Benjamin Netanyahu should not have gone because he is a sponsor of state terrorism. You would say what? A against the Palestinians is what he said. Well, I would say that's a shameful statement that's made uh, by the president of Turkey, uh, who hosts the Hamas terror organization within Turkey. 
I don't think that he's been part of the solution against radical Islam. He's probably been at least in the middle or maybe part of the problem, and I think it's very unfortunate that he says it. He compared Israel to Nazis in the past, and he's made wild statements about Israel that we should not be hearing from a country, from the head of a country like Turkey, which is a member of NATO. Yeah. I think it's very important for the entire civilized world to stand very firmly against terrorism. The Prime Minister of Israel felt it was important for him to stand there with the president of France and with the people of France to show that Israel stands with France against terrorism. I would hope that in the future people would just as strongly stand with Israel in our fight against terrorism. Unfortunately, that has not happened. I hope it happens in the future. I want to play something for you. This is Josh Ernest, the White House spokesperson, speaking about the president's no-show at this march. Roll that tape. I think it's fair to say that we should have sent someone with a higher profile uh, to, to be there. Had the circumstances be a little bit, been a little bit different, I think the president himself would have liked to have had the opportunity to be there. What does that absence of any high-ranking administration official from the United States' perspective, what does that say to you? What is the message? Well, you know, I'll leave it up to the administration officials to, to, to say what it means. I can only tell you why the Prime Minister of Israel felt it was so important to mm -hmm. go. We needed to express our solidarity with the French struggle against terrorism. America leads the world in the struggle against terrorism. This administration is leading it against ISIS. And I'm sure that there is no sympathy whatsoever in any quarters uh, in the United States for, for the terrorists. And as the administration, uh, you know, official said, uh, the spokesman said that maybe they should have sent somebody at the end. I think what's important is not who's there, but what do you do moving forward? Are you willing to confront it? Are you willing to name it what it is? Well, truly? they keep calling it extremism. Extremism. Not, they, 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 there's no fine point on who this enemy is. Is that a mistake? Well, I heard, you know, I heard the president in a recent speech that he gave at the UN talk about the scourge of militant Islam, and I think it's important for him to continue in that direction because he is uniquely placed to, I think, unite the world against this struggle, and it's very important to understand that these are not local problems driven by local grievances. There is a deeper fanaticism where's the roots of this problem. It's not that all these different terror organizations sit in the same war room and plan attacks. And sometimes they fight each other. The radical Shiites will fight right. the They'll radical kill Sunnis. Yeah. They'll kill each other. They hate Jews. They hate Christians. They hate Israel. They hate America. They hate all of this. The first and foremost thing that we have to do to defend our common civilization is basically have zero tolerance for terrorism. Not to try to excuse it, not to try to justify it, not to try to say it's because of this or that local grievance. Right. Nothing justifies this terrorism and we have to stand together and combat it. I want to shift gears for a moment, talk about this Iran deal that the White House is trying to craft over nuclear weapons. Uh, we have relaxed economic sanctions with Iran in the hopes of coming to an arms deal. I know Prime Minister Netanyahu was briefed on Monday by the White House. What's the problem with this, this attempt okay. to try to get everybody to the bargaining Look, the, we would love to see a diplomatic agreement that peacefully dismantles Iran's military nuclear capability. No one would be happier than Israel to see that. Here's the problem. We're not interested just in any agreement. We need an agreement that dismantles Iran's military nuclear capability. What they're talking about is essentially leaving Iran as a threshold nuclear power. That is, with the infrastructure in place, maybe not to have a nuclear weapon today, but to have a nuclear weapon tomorrow. Mm -hmm. We want to see the dismantling of Iran's military nuclear capability, and then in return you can dismantle the sanctions. The last thing you want to do is to dismantle the sanctions regime and to leave Iran as a threshold nuclear power today and virtually guarantee that there, there'll be a nuclear weapon state tomorrow. But, that but is a grave danger the, to my country and the world. The White House says this will stop Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. You don't believe that? I don't believe it's going to stop Iran from having a nuclear weapon. The way you stop Iran from having a nuclear weapon is to dismantle that entire military nuclear capability. You don't leave them with centrifuges. You don't leave them with stockpiles of enriched uranium. Mm -hmm. You don't leave them with underground enrichment bunkers. You don't need to leave them with heavy water facilities. You have to dismantle it. Do you remember the agreement that was made in Syria? Yeah. That was dismantling the infrastructure for chemical weapons mm -hmm. and removing it. That's the kind of deal you have to have in Iran mm -hmm. to give us some comfort that the foremost sponsor of terrorism in the world, and people forget that's what Iran is, should not come anywhere close to having nuclear weapons. Not today and not tomorrow. Mm. Final question. Uh, Mitch McConnell and the GOP would like to see new economic sanctions leveled against Iran. There is a bill on the floor of the Senate to move that forward. It has major support, veto-proof support. Do you support it? 
we support more pressure on Iran. The greater the pressure that is put on Iran, the greater the chance that you actually can achieve a diplomatic, uh, a good diplomatic agreement. The goal, again, is not to get a deal with Iran. Mm -hmm. A deal with Iran that leaves them as a threshold nuclear power is a bad deal. The goal is to dismantle the program. And with Iran, the greater the pressure that you put on Iran, the greater the chance for you to get such a deal. Before I let you go, I know there is that uh, pact that has been on the table for a long time between Israel and the Holy See, the Vatican. Uh, when the Pope was in Israel last year, there was talk that this would hasten. Do you know where that, that is at this point? I don't know exactly where it stands now. I will say that, you know, we're, we, we very much appreciated uh, the Pope's visit to Israel. We, sent, we think he sent a very strong message. He seems to be a unique a unique person and a unique figure, and hopefully he can play a positive role moving forward, and Israel would certainly like to resolve all the outstanding issues we have in the Vatican, because we are actually part of a common civilization. Yeah. And I think the Pope has lent his voice to many issues, uh, and I think it's important for the Pope's voice, for Israel, for other countries who want to stand up to this militancy, to stand very firmly and strongly together. Mm. And good relations between Israel and the Vatican can only help that. Mm. Ambassador Dermer, thank you thank so you. much for being here. We hope you'll come back. Thank you. You can learn more about Israel's embassy here in the U.S. and the work of Ambassador Ron Dermer by visiting IsraelEMB.org.